Three, two. Hello and welcome to this webinar. Uh, a webinar that is uh, going to discuss a Green Deal for all after COVID-19. My name is Robert Watt. I'm the Communications Director um, at SEI, Stockholm Environment Institute, which is one of the co-organisers of this webinar. Uh, a webinar that we're very happy to have put together to get, uh, with the Institute for a European Environmental Policy uh, as part of the Think 2030 group uh, of uh, uh, think tanks. Um, today we're going to be uh, hearing from a fantastic panel uh, of different of speakers. Uh, we have with us uh, from Spain Teresa Ribera, who is the Minister for the Ecological Transition and Demographic Challenge. Uh, we will have uh, Maria Joao Rodriguez from Portugal, uh, who is the head of FEPS um, and is a former minister and MEP. Uh, we will also have uh, Sirpa Pietikainen from Finland, uh, who is also a former minister uh, and is a current MEP. Uh, we have Celine Shavariat, who is the head of IEEP, the Institute for European Environmental Policy and then Claudia Strambo and Aaron Atteridge, both from SEI. So a really big panel, uh, but a lot of expertise. Um, and uh, I think we're going to have a, a really good conversation. Um, today we're using uh, the platform called Teams Live, um, and we would like to have as much engagement with you, the audience, as possible. You'll be able to um, ask questions uh, using the Q&A panel, um, and we will do our best to uh, make sure that we get through as many of those questions as possible. We're going to have a Q&A a couple of times during the course of the webinar. Uh, once after Celine has made her presentation uh, of a new report um, on a Green Deal for All, and also once uh, after uh, Claudia and Aaron have made their presentation relating to Just Transitions. Um, We've already heard many of you, uh, a call from Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, to build back better after this crisis. We also know that uh, the Commissioner Timmermans has said that we must not return to a carbon spewing economy and that the Green Deal is something that the European Commission is still committed to, even uh, at the current during the current pandemic crisis. And only a few weeks ago, a group of European parliamentarians put together a Green Recovery Alliance, which included not only members of the European Parliament, but also CEOs and other key actors. And then the European Environment, uh, uh, several European Environment and Climate Ministers um, signed a letter calling on the Green Deal to be at the heart of the recovery. And one of those ministers um, that was part of that call uh, is Minister Ribera uh, from Spain. And I'd like to offer the floor to Minister Ribera, who's going to give us our first insight into Spain and the Green Deal and the recovery. Over to you, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and um, thanks for this, um, this opportunity. I, um, I have to say that uh, it's a pleasure to see you all, even if it is in the screens. Um, and um, I also have to say that it is a very good opportunity to have some insights from the outside world because this uh, these weeks of confinement um, allow us to think a lot, but in a much more introspective perspective. So sometimes we may be missing things that are happening around us uh, and um, may be important for the for the time to come to to recover this capacity to coordinate and to to exchange views in order to to avoid mistakes and uh, missing relevant issues and perspectives that uh, should uh, be in our focus. I, I could make some uh, comments on this issue. Um, how is he thinks in, in Spain and what about uh, a Green Deal? Um, just to share with you, I don't know if you knew, but uh, I had a, a very nice uh, task uh, being allocated by my Prime Minister. I don't know why, I guess that is the climate challenge that uh, put me in a, in, a, in, the, in the right position to have this prize on my shoulders, which, um, which is to coordinate the, 
the um, the de-escalation strategy. So, how how we can um, uh, organize things in order to get um, out of uh, this. Uh, uh, confinement and the health uh, measures, and I have to, to tell you that it is uh, it was hard uh, and, uh, and and sad the confinement exercise, and it is difficult and complicated the exit strategy, which is uh, quite a curious thing. It is easier to get 47 million people at home than organizing how people. Yeah, leaves their homes and recovers the, uh, the economic activities and, um, and the, uh, the normal uh, social and, and family uh, welfare. I think that there are three or four issues that are very important um, and I would like to share with you. The first of them being that um, we have uh, seen to what extent it is important uh, um, to have a previous uh, understanding on why uh, science and policy uh, need to talk each other on uh, how a uh, um, sound science based decisions uh, may avoid uh, additional difficulties. Nobody had uh, done this type of exercise. We have been doing uh, um, in, uh, in many countries around the world this, uh, this previous month. So there were some experiences uh, um, in, in Asia and in Africa dealing with uh, pandemics that were terrible, but we, we have not had this this big size of the world uh, wide uh, um, uh, size uh, this this uh, this response. So I think that it is important to to be smart um, and to take the opportunity to stress this very relevant message. How effective we can be uh, in order to integrate the um, science based uh, solutions when uh, trying to identify the right combination of uh, measures to be adopted by policymakers. The second thing we learn is that uh, um, people uh, start to consider, as it was uh, the case when uh, Fukushima <laughs> eroded the confidence uh, of the world on the, the capacity to um, anticipate potential risk. It is very interesting to see uh, the discussion of the type of risk we are not uh, ready to accept. And I think that this also applies to climate and biodiversity losses risk. For the time being, it has still been in the collective imagination as something that was, was much more theoretical than real in terms of damage. Um, and uh, now we have experience. We uh, realize uh, how something that was very theoretical, a virus uh, uh, infecting uh, the whole humankind, uh, becomes real and the people got it by surprise. Uh, I think that we are still digesting what does this mean, what this means. And I think that this uh, discussion on what is the level of uh, acceptance in terms of uh, potential risk uh, being uh, becoming real, uh, it is also an interesting um, uh, issue to, to comment when dealing with, uh, with climate and with dealing with, uh, with biodiversity losses and the, and the green agenda. The third thing is that um, we have experienced something we had previewed, but um, we um, we hadn't realized, uh, which is uh, uh, what does uh, um, it mean uh, having a collapse of the traditional energy system and the collapse of the oil prices. So we had defined and thought about uh, stranded assets, but now we have got a very possible it is not uh, something that will last as we have seen it in the in these uh, last weeks but uh, it's the first real experience of things happening so fast so quick so quick and in such an expected manner um, and at the same time a, quite a big shock in the in the energy markets they uh, are good times for renewable energy but then we have a problem of um, a deep change in the business model, how we cover the fixed cost of the system, what does this mean in terms of uh, business model uh, solutions and so on. So many things happening that uh, we did not uh, uh, expect to happen so soon and so fast. Same for biodiversity recovery or air quality recovery. Uh, what does this mean in terms of the relation of any citizen with the city and with the public space? Uh, it's a big opportunity to push into the right direction and we hadn't thought about this opportunity as being so close, so fast, 
so real. So I think that um, there are many things and, and many opportunities to draw lessons from what we have been experiencing and we should not miss those opportunities, uh, even if uh, um, uh, it is challenging. I mean, I think it's not something to take for granted. We know that there will be many pushes in many different direction, directions, but I think that there are uh, um, uh, very interesting opportunities to think about uh, all these experiences when talking about uh, political decisions, appetite from investors and type of uh, business models being changed in a very short period of time because we have been experiencing a very deep cultural change in our minds. And I think that this is the most uh, um, interesting um, thing. Then I guess that um, there are uh, some uh, topics we have already identified we should not um, forget. Uh, we have been building all um, our uh, literature on the basis of leave no one behind. So we have been working on how to uh, get rid of coal uh, on a just transition basis and how to create new models of employment and jobs and how to create new models of energy systems, all these things. We should not forget about that, but we may be identifying a, um, new, new groups of workers that may be going through similar situations. For instance, we in Spain had advanced a lot, even during these times, on uh, the creation of a just transition institute and to put in place all these just transition plans and so on. And now people react and say, hey, why the coal people must be in a better position than we, the rest of the society, that are experiencing such a big shock in the tourism sector, for instance, or in the, um, in the transport uh, sector, in the flight uh, and, uh, and, uh, and air travel sector. So I think that um, this is tricky because there were um, parameters that uh, were built uh, um, in a certain context and were perfectly valid and suddenly we are uh, fastening uh, the transformation of many different sectors much faster than what we could expect. So how we can um, uh, go faster in the creation of new opportunities, what does this mean for the digital world for instance, I think that this is a winner uh, um, Pick that uh, we should uh, be taking advantage of uh, um, and, and, and all the related uh, um, sectors that uh, may help us in order to identify uh, new, new opportunities. Then I think that um, there are other um, uh, elements that combine with this, with this idea. Uh, something that uh, was perceived um, as a um, low profile, difficult um, uh, field to work uh, on the green agenda suddenly has become a, a, uh, a winner sector. Now I refer to the farmers and to those producing food uh, and then the connection to the biodiversity patterns and the, uh, and the land protection and, and so on. Again, a new focus to, to, to recover and to, to refocus uh, in the time in the time uh, in the time to be. I think that this is also an interesting an interesting approach uh, which we're trying to push. And then I come to, to Europe and to, to what it should be a, um, a more or less consistent uh, um, approach on the recovery plans at the national level and then at the at the European level. My impression is that um, the, um, the basics of our previous approach are very valid. But um, we need to be smart when uh, identifying uh, the different intensities along the time. Um, in my experience, uh, we should uh, try to uh, focus in the short term uh, and uh, to build in the mid and long term. For instance, something we are getting much pressure on. Let's think about uh, wind, offshore wind, which is fantastic. Let's think about hydrogen, fantastic. Let's think about ester, esterage, uh, stocking uh, energy, of course. The, um, those were three winning pillars that uh, should be part of any strategy in the time to come. 
But what I need to, uh, to know is that this will be something very interesting to happen in at least three or four, five years time. And people have been confined the uh, seven weeks, eight weeks, six weeks. There have been big uh, shocks in the, um, in, the, in the way people uh, has been um, enjoying life or even losing jobs. So we need to come back to identify what are the very short term initiatives that may be consistent with the green recovery because we need to build and to and to pay attention to the to the two uh, to the two speeds in the short term we may think about the the green retrofitting buildings the recovery of the cities the um, services of the environment i mean so many things that may be important in the short term but we need to stress that there are exits that also play a an important role in the very short term because people um, have, have been very patient that um, will become a little bit mad when, 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 when being in such a strange situation for such a long time. And that would facilitate uh, the time to come. So thinking of um, the, uh, the strategies of exit of uh, this uh, virus as a part of uh, the uh, policies to manage the sanitary crisis, this health crisis is very important, but also to take this uh, transition time as a, um, a relevant piece in the exit and bringing strategy in the time to come is also, is also, is also true. I think that um, we may be um, facing a different um, pressures and lobbies uh, and the, we should um, uh, be quite smart on uh, how to avoid uh, any uh, anything that is inconsistent, but how to be flexible on those things that uh, were not our favorite options, but may need some extra time. And I'm thinking about, for instance, something which is very stupid and which is madness for the time being in Spain, plastics. Uh, single-use plastics. Um, very honestly, I cannot come up to the street to say, hey, forbidden. People is crazy about uh, their health security patterns. So I cannot say plastics are forbidden. I need to be a little bit more flexible and I will be uh, thinking how I can identify different streams of plastic to be managed probably in a delayed uh, context that I need to keep uh, an empathy uh, to the towards uh, the people otherwise people uh, will become uh, mad about uh, about us or the most crazy thing we will be experiencing mobility i think that mobility in the urban and metropolitan areas uh, is at risk because people become mad about the virus and then they prefer to take their own cars and then they forget about the mass transportation and then uh, we need to say yes the bicycles the, the 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 people walking in the streets and so on but even in that context we may be uh, facing challenges about uh, uh, around that so again we need to identify how we can combine a uh, a clear uh, determined uh, willingness to stick to what we need to achieve and how we can provide uh, some flexibilities that uh, do not um, give the impression that uh, we become uh, rigid and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, extra uh, uh, threat, uh, how to say that, uh, and people coming from outside the world, outside the earth, imposing things that do not match to uh, people's concerns. And, and I think that uh, this is going to be very delicate. We, we, we need to think how we can uh, provide the, those flexibilities where and, and how. And then I guess that um, uh, there are some additional, and with this I, I, I end my comments, some additional issues that we have not paid attention to that uh, become very interesting. For instance, um, the, um, the issue of um, health services and care services. I think that this is very interesting. This appeals to very human values that we had forgotten. Uh, or at least we have taken for granted 
and suddenly they, they become very, very important for anyone. So I, I guess that there are some connections to also take care of nature, take care of people, take care of uh, um, uh, solidarity values, uh, cooperation, uh, and so on. So I think that these are values we, we should be uh, trying to, to promote and to, and to pay attention to pay attention to. Particularly, we've seen that with the elder, but not only. That, that also applies to, as I say, rural areas and, and, and so on. And uh, um, also, and, uh, and this is curious, um, this idea uh, of um, the need to be to, to to remember, we need to be humble and uh, and uh, <laughs> and and to take into consideration that the, the world was very small, but not as small as we thought. So to have breakfast in Paris, have lunch in Moscow, and have dinner. In, uh, in Japan. I mean, uh, the world has become uh, interdependent, but, um, but, uh, but we are not those uh, super powerful beings that are able to take everything under control. Things have their own dynamics, things have um, their own uh, balances, and, uh, and recover the sense of uh, smallness, our size, our relative size in the world, is um, is important and this applies to industry. I think that trade and industry uh, have got a, uh, a big uh, a big shock in, in this uh, in this uh, in these weeks. I think that it has been shameful. Uh, this uh, global marketplace of mask and so on, something that apparently had no ad, particular add value and has become. Uh, an absolutely madness when trying to get a mask for, for, for anyone in Europe um, and uh, or any of these uh, health uh, um, additional goods that uh, that um, that were not uh, so easy to 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 be got and found in the market. So uh, this this also makes us uh, recover a sense of. Uh, a balance on uh, what are the industrial capacities that um, that we need uh, to 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 pay attention to in Europe. Sometimes for very well, uh, what to say, a, um, basic goods, and sometimes uh, because it is a bet in terms of add value in industrial production that uh, that is important to to put in place. So when I hear Timmerman saying. He wants to push for this uh, green piece in the package, this uh, digital piece in the package, and this resilience piece in the package. I think it's a good approach. Resilience is also welfare in our cities, is also infrastructure, but it is also a good type of um, a uh, future-oriented industry that needed today is in the package. So I think that uh, it is it is um, it is a good guide. I think it is a good piece uh, to discuss uh, how we can combine national and European capacities to to build together. It's been a little bit chaotic, but I was not sure about what you expected from me. So I, I tried to to wrap up a few few ideas on on this issue. Thank you. <clears throat> Minister, thank you very much for those remarks. Uh, I think you covered a huge amount of ground there um, and have really given us insight into the situation you're facing, uh, where uh, you may be working extremely hard with this de escalation while at the same time trying to avoid a sort of re escalation of, of, of environmental uh, and, and social impacts uh, as well. And it's a hard, a hard nut to crack. Um, I wanted to follow up, if I may, before I hand uh, get, move on to a, an, our next presenter. I really wanted to follow up actually um, on this point of there being some real economic and political uh, imperatives in the short term, getting people back to back to work, uh, not only if they have jobs, but also so, in the circumstances so, so. of a recession and people have also lost jobs. And you've, you've mentioned a few key sectors there or, or avenues that, that, that might be pursued. Digital, um, the, the sort of the food system more generally, uh, a transport, um, 
I'm just wondering whether you could have any any specifics or through any contacts you've had with uh, industry and, and, and with employers as to what sort of things that they're looking for is is, is are there are there particular sectors that could be uh, you know, quick starts, quick wins for uh, getting people back to work, but in a way that bridges, if you like, the short term imperative with the medium and long term uh, desire to have a green uh, uh, restart uh, to, to the economy? Well, I think that um, each sector has got its own uh, difficulties that's that's for sure for the food system it was very interesting to um, to see the change i mean people that uh, had the impression to be a um, second row group of workers suddenly become uh, the heroes that provide food for everybody and that has happened to to the food security or the to the garbage management i mean uh, workers that uh, were perceived as second third row and and have recovered some dignity and i think that this is very interesting because uh, um, that that uh, applies to an opportunity to rebalance uh, uh, um, the societies that uh, had become increasingly dualized in terms of uh, intellectual uh, chic uh, uh, and materialized uh, workers versus uh, industrial farmers and and uh, and, um, and city services. So I think that that's interesting. The second thing is that um, now that uh, they feel uh, more empowered and recognized, um, we need uh, to 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 introduce and to strengthen uh, better customs, better ways to produce. I think that uh, that this is this is important. And at the same time, there are all those workers that uh, were not bad position that are suffering the big shock of uh, the economy being stopped. So we need to provide opportunities for these people because uh, it will take some time and we cannot talk about very sophisticated uh, things in the in the mid term. So that 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 could be that could be important for for a, a large number of uh, sectors, uh, of course, dealing with uh, uh, cafes and restaurants, but also dealing with uh, all the tourism related activities or dealing with, as I say, mobility, mobility, not just in the urban and metropolitan areas, but also uh, well, we are seeing that and it, it is interesting what it has happened in, in France. I mean, I remember when uh, Greta Thunberg and in Sweden, you started to say uh, we are experiencing already a, a relevant decrease of uh, um, the demand in, in the um, uh, air flights uh, and suddenly it, it doesn't exist anymore. People is not taking planes uh, and that is going to be a shock. And there will be a big push to recover. I don't think we are going to come back to the previous situation as such, but I think that we need to think what we want. I mean, we, we still need uh, air flights and air travels, but uh, we may need to think what type of air travels we may be pushing. I and mean, this idea of increasing the number of, uh, of flights all over the world with no limits didn't work. And now uh, we have an opportunity to think about, about that. Um, so I guess that there is room to, 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 to move with much flexibility, but um, we need to, to think how we can frame it in a context that, uh, that matches as much as possible to what it may be our mid and long term goals. As I said, showing some flexibility. I don't think it is a good idea to say, no, 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 now uh, this is a stop forever. I mean, or, or as I said, with the example of the plastics, uh, we were doing our, our work. But now I don't feel like uh, being too insistent on uh, forbidden, uh, for, uh, forbidden the, the, the single use plastics in the very short term. So I think that there are things that 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 will need to be um, reframed in the in the time scale, and and uh, that implies accelerate some of them, and to be a little bit more flexible on uh, on some others. Uh, um, that that was my general my general comment. Yes, I think, um, and I, I think the point you're making around legitimacy uh, that also for the long term legitimacy of the 
uh, systemic changes that are implied by the Green Deal, by the sort of policies you're pursuing in, in, in just transitions and in moving uh, away from a fossil economy, legitimacy is important. And, uh, and that's something that, that needs to be borne in mind when, when, when coming out of the current crisis. Um, and and I, I'm, we're now, it's time for us to, to hand over to Céline Chaveriat, who's the head of the Institute for European Environmental Policy. And, and Céline, um, Theresa uh, mentioned the concept of leaving no one behind um, and how important it was it was to, to, to see that as being compatible, a, a component of, of the Green Deal. And essentially, I think that is one of the key messages coming out from this new policy report. Uh, that is um, the, the, that you're going to present to us. So um, let's hear more uh, from you, Celine, please. Thank you so much uh, to the minister, but also uh, to Robert. It's great to be here with all of you today in these crazy times where we are confined, but yet we're able to speak uh, through uh, the di digital technology with so many people. I hear there are 200 people watching right now. So this is really exciting. I'm very um, happy to present you uh, Green Deal for All, which is the new report that uh, IEP has developed together with FEPS. Uh, and I would like very much to thank uh, FEPS. This work started actually under the sponsorship of Mi Minister Rivera uh, at the last uh, New York uh, Climate Summit, uh, when at the global level, we talked together with other experts to try and think how do we make sure equity is at the center of the sustainability transition? And we started to look at three uh, different uh, uh, axes. Uh, next slide. Uh, one is uh, how do we make sure that there, we, there is equity within uh, every country? Because as we know, not everyone has the same vulnerability to climate change, but also the same capability uh, or resilience. And right now we see that those different uh, vulnerabilities and capacities uh, will also uh, take place as part of the economic recession. So in a way we are seeing intertwined different sets of vulnerabilities and capabilities uh, in the twin shocks that we're having, the climate crisis, but also other environmental crises, as well as the economic recession. The second very important uh, access, and I'm sure that Minister Ribera would agree, is making sure in Europe that we harness the Green Deal for greater cohesion and solidarity. We have countries in the south of Europe, in the east and the central parts of Europe who are facing different sets of vulnerabilities, but also do not necessarily have the same capabilities as richer parts of Europe. And we need to make sure that we in, in harness the Green Deal, but also the recovery, to make sure there's greater convergence in terms of GDP per capita between the different countries of Europe. And the third very important axis uh, is fostering intergenerational solidarity. As we have seen, uh, the elderly have been severely hit by the current crisis. We also know uh, from uh, death uh, statistics uh, from heat waves that they are particularly vulnerable to some of the impacts of climate change. They're also on fixed income and therefore they're unlikely to be able to uh, cope with uh, any reforms that would increase the prices of essential goods very significantly. And I hear that in some countries, food prices are increasing, for instance, in Poland. So we need to think about the specific vulnerabilities of the elderly. But we also need to think of the youth and the next generation. And again, here, we know that youth is already one of the income groups most at risk of poverty in Europe and uh, their unemployment uh, uh, rate is twice as much as the rest of the population. And we know that um, it's very likely, unfortunately, that they will be badly hit uh, by the rise of unemployment in the current crisis. So how can we deliver for uh, uh, both the elderly, but also youth, and also very importantly, future generations? We cannot have another lost decade of environmental action because we know by then the window of opportunity for action will have closed and we will basically ask the next generations to pay a very uh, a crippling ecological debt because we postponed changes uh, to the point that it's no longer impossible to, to do them. Next slide. So then looking at uh, intra-country uh, uh, proposals, 
And there I wanted to highlight that we're in a situation where there are many people still in poverty in Europe. Uh, Europe did miss its target uh, to uh, reduce poverty. Uh, the target was to reduce poverty by 20 million. This was missed. And we're more likely to see an increase in poverty linked uh, with the recession. And we already know that it is uh, low income communities who have the greatest exposure to pollution, to hazards. They're really useful new work from the EEA on this topic. They have less access to green spaces. They have uh, a more uh, less healthy uh, uh, inside uh, air in their houses and they also have less access to, to healthy food. We see also rural urban divides with many rural people having no access to public transport. So again, in terms of thinking of sustainable mobility, it's really important. But we also see racial and ethnic discrimination. If you look at Roma communities, there's a recent report from EEB that looks at the fact that they are more likely than other communities to be uh, 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 living on the waste dumps and heavily contaminated sites. So now coming to um, specific recommendations, we think it's really important as part of green recovery plans to make sure that we are indeed on a pathway for systemic change. But as the minister said, it's really important to make sure that we will also create jobs for those who need them right now. This means low skill jobs and projects that can be rapidly uh, deployed. One area that's not been yet mentioned in the discussion is large scale recovery of ecosystems. This has been used in the New Deal back in the days uh, uh, in, in, uh, by the United States. And this could really help also provide jobs in uh, rural communities or in areas that uh, would not be necessarily uh, positively affected by other measures. The other suggestion we make is that we need a green scrutiny uh, recovery board to make sure that there is an independent source of information to scrutinize the different plans by the member states. There are a number of additional proposals here on the slide. I will only focus on one, the idea of distributing pollution dividends to European citizens. We know that there will not be enough funding uh, to, uh, to fund all the need for help. Uh, that, that people have, uh, as the minister said, many sectors are lining up and asking for assistance. So we need to find money somewhere. And this is a good time to get rid of fossil fuel subsidies. This is also very important to have a carbon floor and therefore we can use the revenues uh, linked with the carbon floor uh, to distribute them to those in need. And we could also look at doubling environmental taxes. But then we can't do that if people don't see benefits for them. So that those funds need to be earmarked to support people who have lost their jobs. Uh, there is a new uh, proposal for uh, an employment support program in the EU. Others are talking about uh, universal basic income. Or you could also propose a massive reduction in the taxation of labor to support again return to employment. Next slide. Then looking at uh, the inequity uh, and the injustices between different countries and regions of Europe, you can see from uh, the right side of this slide that uh, with the, the, the dark blue, that uh, some countries are actually losing years of life. This is about years of life lost due to air pollution. And you can see that there's a much bigger impact on parts of Europe than in other parts. So we need to make sure that uh, the re green recovery will address those specific problems. We also know that some regions of Europe do not have very good infrastructure. We need to prioritize low carbon infrastructure uh, uh, programs as part of the cohesion policy and the response to the crisis. We also need to think about ways in which the industrial strategy will not only benefit the most advanced countries in Europe, who already have a lot of money and a lot of capacity to make use of the new opportunities, but make sure we locate new industries in depressed regions and well -off, uh, less well-off countries. And this will require intervention. It will not happen on its own. And that's why it's really important to put that at the heart of, of the recovery. And when I think of our own, my own sector research, we need to make sure that the think tanks in those uh, less well-off uh, regions and countries will survive, but also that research is being thought 
in terms of addressing the specific issues that these countries have. Next slide. And then uh, last but not least, uh, if you look at what happened since 1990, it's fair to say that we haven't done uh, terribly well, although we knew very well what was going on with climate change. And what we can't have is a continuation of this pattern, because as I said, otherwise, uh, it is the next generation and youth uh, that will pay the price. That's why it's very important to future-proof in infrastructure investment. What does that mean? It means having a different discount rate when you actually uh, look at uh, whether you want to deploy one solution or another in terms of infrastructure. We also need to enshrine the principle of intergenerational justice in terms of the new climate law. Uh, another idea would be to make sure that there will be green jobs for, for the youth. And we were talking about a green, more resilient uh, care economy. How can we make sure that youth would be part of this great, uh, green and resilient uh, care economy? And then also, let's not forget the elderly. Uh, an area for the green recovery might be also to uh, double down on efforts on adaptation. Uh, let, let's make sure we take into account the vulnerabilities of the elderly in terms of the climate adaptation. But let's also look at the fact that the elderly um, or people that are retired are still, for many of them, very healthy and very capable. We propose a green volunteerism program for pensioners because we know that the pensioners are actually the backbone of uh, the, 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 the social economy and, and civil society. So let's make sure that they can participate also to the green recovery effort. So these are some of the proposals that we have uh, uh, so far. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention and really look forward to the debate. Thank you. Celine, thank you very much um, for that quick overview of what is a, a really a very a rich report. I, I do recommend everybody um, to go to the IEP website and, and take a look at it. It's not too long uh, and it really has some uh, excellent ideas and, and concrete proposals uh, for answering the sorts of challenge that uh, uh, Minister Ribera, for example, is, is, is facing. Uh, uh, and uh, we have now um, our, our uh, a little time for uh, responses uh, from some of our panel members. Um, and we have with us uh, Maria Joao Rodriguez, um, who was a Minister for uh, Qualifications and Employment in the Portuguese uh, government uh, in the 1990s, uh, has been an MEP and also uh, deeply involved with uh, European policy making for several decades, not least in the formation of some of the EU's long term uh, policies and strategies. Um, and I'd like to offer uh, the opportunity for Maria perhaps to, to comment on some of the things that have come up so far um, in terms of the specific policies that uh, Celine has been put forward uh, relating perhaps to um, the, the dividend, the pollution dividend, uh, changes to taxation, for example, which I, uh, I, are, are key parts of this sort of bridging between the short and the medium term uh, 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 changes. Uh, that are here. Um, and Maria, if you're with us, it would be great to hear yes, from you. Yes. <laughs> okay. Hello, everybody, and the great pleasure to join you uh, and uh, to be part of this launch of a report uh, sponsored by FEPS and the, the president of uh, FEPS, the European Foundation for Progressive Studies, and uh, brilliant uh, delivered by uh, IEP. And I'm so glad that I'm again speaking here with uh, Celine and with Teresa Ribera because we were together on the eve of the climate summit in New York, uh, fighting for climate justice. And after that, uh, we start again fighting for the European Green Deal. Well, uh, nobody was uh, expecting to have this COVID crisis. So I will center my comment on something every, everyone is asking now, I believe, which is what might be the implications of the COVID crisis on the European Green Deal. And let me tell you uh, clearly that we do have some actors now uh, arguing that because of the COVID crisis, we no longer have the conditions to uh, push for the European Green Deal 
and these should uh, be somehow forgotten. What, uh, let me tell you what I think about this. Not at all. We cannot, uh, on the contrary, the COVID crisis is bringing many important new arguments to push for the European Green Deal. The first one is that all of us, we are having a new perception about what is a healthy life. Such an important value for all of us. And a healthy life is also about having a healthy relationship with the planet and with the environment. This is first. Secondly, uh, we are fighting not only to save lives right now, but also fighting to save jobs. And something uh, incredible is happening right now is in many companies, uh, including SMEs, we are saving jobs by going digital and low carbon. So this shows this is possible because we are reinventing the way we work, the way we discuss, and because of this, we are in fact um, going low carbon with a different way to use transport. Mm -hmm. The third reason is that right now we are understanding that uh, there is a big risk of uh, losing jobs because of the financial crisis coming and we need to create much more jobs and jobs of the future. And that's the third reason why we do need the European Green Deal. Because the European Green Deal is about transforming our economies, but also about creating many new jobs. So there is a very good argument for this. Um, but that said, as our report is claiming in the title, we want a Green Deal for all with social fairness. And Celine was very precise on coming with concrete proposals on how can we deliver the Green Deal for all. Let me just uh, underline that right now in the political discussion in the European institutions, we are having um, a big debate on how to finance this. How to finance a European Green Deal for all. And this is about designing the upcoming recovery plan. And all member states must implement a recovery plan. And right now, let's be frank, we don't have all the necessary financial means. Of course, we want the banks to, su to support sustainable finance, but we also know that national budgets and European budget will be central for this. So right now, uh, the European Commission has a mandate to revise deeply the European budget for the next years to make sure that the Green Deal will be there even stronger. And right now, we have uh, given the mandate to the European Commission to propose a recovery fund, something new, something to complement the European budget. And I believe this recovery fund should be also a powerful instrument to finance the European Green Deal. Let me recall that we are speaking about one trillion and a half. This is a lot of money. And this is the right moment to direct the, the money in such a way that the Green Deal will come stronger. My final comment is about the solidarity between generations. Uh, because, as Salid was saying, solidarity between generations will be crucial. The same way we have now this solidarity working a lot to save lives in the COVID crisis and to save jobs, we also need to have this solidarity to fight against climate change and to protect our environment. So we need our political institutions to put this solidarity at the heart. So all these messages are contained in our report. 
And uh, this is my comment. Thank you very much. Maria, thank you very much for those those comments. Um, I, I'd like to just follow up on 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 one question or uh, that 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 your remarks raised with me. Um, just this this importance of the European budget uh, and the multi-annual uh, uh, financial framework discussions that are currently ongoing. C can you? Give us a little bit more. You talked about the, the need for a recovery fund and that this should be a, a deep review of, of European budgets. Can you go, give us a little bit more of an in, in indication as, as to uh, where that money needs to be spent, uh, both in terms of the recovery, but also for the longer term Green Deal? Well, let me just give some examples building on our report. We need to have a complete transformation of our transport system to make it a sustainable one, a green one. Secondly, uh, we need, when it comes manufacturing sectors, to uh, reorganize our supply chains according to a paradigm of circular economy, uh, to, to have really a new generation of manufacturing sector in, 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 uh, in Europe. Third, our agriculture needs to also be reorganized to provide healthy food affordable for all citizens in Europe. This is also a big transformation of agriculture. Fourth example is about education. We see right now that education can have another way to be provided with less implications for physical mobility, transportation. And we can have, let's say, a more smarter digital and low carbon delivery of education. And the same happens with public service services. So I think that um, this is a paradox because uh, we are dealing with the tragedy of the COVID crisis, but now we have a big uh, cultural transformation because millions and pe millions of people are asking themselves, perhaps we need to change the way we live for a more healthy life. Uh, and uh, we need to use this new perception uh, to have uh, new priorities in the upcoming European budget because the European budget should uh, support this change in uh, way of life. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, and, and now I, I can see from the uh, comments and the questions coming in um, that we've, we've got uh, something like 250 people joining us on the webinar and they really are from all parts of the world there are plenty of people from uh, European countries but we also see people joining from Africa from India uh, uh, and and from Australia uh, I'm going to hand over to uh, my co-moderator Gregor uh, Gregor you've been taking a look at the questions coming in and I think you might have selected a couple to to throw out to Celine um, uh, and also to Maria uh, over to you Greg Yes, hi everyone. I don't know if you can see me. I've had some trouble with my camera, but uh, so happy to be here uh, to, at your service today. Great comments. Um, to uh, Celine, we have a question from Christian Hay. Uh, he picked up on your idea on investing in ecosystem restoration. However, he wonders if there is a need for a new fund or if we can uh, achieve these uh, ecosystem restorations with existing funds. And then, of course, in the context of the recently postponed biodiversity strategy and the farm to fork strategy. And maybe Celine, you can also tell us the newest on when these two strategies might come uh, online, so to say. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for the question. Um, I think it, it's it's probably both. As we know, uh, there are when you know the, of the funds available uh, to help restore ecosystem, and unfortunately, this is the case of many uh, programs that exist to support uh, uh, green projects. Uh, they are not necessarily 
of the funds that are available, uh, the, the member states are not necessarily availing themselves of the existing uh, opportunity. Uh, but at, at the same time, I think it's, it's, it's worth remembering that we have clear targets for spending on climate change within the European budget. We do not have such targets on biodiversity. And it's clear now that nature-based solutions are both very important, uh, obviously, for uh, restoration of ecosystems, but also uh, to help mitigate and adapt to climate change. And that's why uh, a, a number of proposals are being made. I can refer, for instance, to the, the bond challenge, where a number of countries within, uh, actually more outside of Europe than within Europe, are saying that they want to commit to uh, restoring uh, uh, ecosystems at a, at, a, at a large scale. So whether this is just using the existing funds or putting a new instruments on the table, I think is a critical part of, of the discussion. And as you know, I mean, uh, right now, the biodiversity and the farm to fork uh, strategy are expected in May, but we've seen that there's been some postponement uh, of, um, uh, of, of, of the times of different uh, areas, including biodiversity and farm to fork. And I think we're seeing that the Commission, you know, has a lot on its plate right now and is finding it very difficult to deliver everything that was foreseen in the Green Deal. Also, because there are new debates erupting, for instance, um, the narrative uh, right now around food security, which is coming very strongly again from the farmers community. And depending where it goes, it could be more towards sustainability or uh, towards maintaining the status quo around the common agricultural policy and just using um, emergency measures to continue propping up a system that we think is fundamentally broken, which might be another reason why it's taking a bit longer for the Commission to come up with its proposals. Great, thank you. Uh, are we going on, Rob, or do we have room for another question from the audience? So, Greg, if you have one more question, perhaps uh, from our audience. Yes, we have a question here about Eric Peel from Future Earth. Uh, and that goes to everyone, maybe particularly to, to Maria then. If the green restart uh, requires not just new investments, but also phasing out certain sectors and services. Uh, and do you think that there are businesses that you can see that we should not save, uh, but rather let die, given that the discussion we were having often are not just about saving industries, but saving jobs? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Greg. Maria, uh, Maria, uh, are you able to take this one for us? For us. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, this is in fact the, the last one because uh, I need to start sharing another conference online. But uh, many thanks for this question. This is indeed a very important one. And my answer is yes. Uh, when I argue that we should prepare for a big transformation, this means that new activities and new jobs will replace old activities and old jobs. Mm -hmm. um, these should be supported, I believe, by an active European industrial innovation policy combined with employment and skills. A lot of skills development must be provided. And as well, uh, was arguing, the COVID crisis makes this even more urgent because the COVID crisis is involving a financial crisis and a social crisis. And so we need to respond to this with a powerful program to launch new activities, new jobs with new skills. So I believe this is the moment to start with the, this bold program. And this should be inspired by a new Green Deal vision for our societies, for sure. Yes. Next, next. 
maybe uh, thank you, Maya Jean, for, for this response. And in terms of maybe adding a few elements, I think, as the minister said, the issue of timing is very uh, crucial. It's a different thing to recapitalize an industry that's uh, facing massive liquidity issues. And I think uh, I would be strongly advising against saying, no, that should not be happening. But then the question is, how rapidly do you move to uh, the next phase where, number one, you should not be postponing structural reforms? It's very important to see that in the last economic crisis, uh, some structural reforms were postponed. If you just spend public money, but you postpone reforms, you're actually not having a systemic impact. So there needs to be a conversation with any industry that's getting recapitalized on you know, the Green Deal pathway and no lobbying from these industries to permanently postpone uh, uh, reforms. The other thing, of course, is to make sure as part of uh, the public spending uh, that we, we, we know that for sure the jobs will be saved. There's a long literature of supporting to support to industries that are on their way out, where you end up wasting a lot of funds because after two years, guess what? All those jobs are being, uh, again, made redundant. So one needs to really look at the examples and the lessons from past programs to prevent wasting public funds on companies that in any case might not survive and therefore instead pro propose structural reorientation measures that focus on workers so that the workers get another job and possibly uh, in a greener sector or company. Celine, thank you very much um, for adding uh, to, to, to that uh, answer there um, and actually also providing us with uh, a great introduction to our next speakers uh, and, pr and the presentation they will give because uh, as you talked about the need to make sure that workers uh, are protected, um, even if jobs uh, in some sectors, in some industries are disappearing. That's the sort of thing that they've been looking at and they've been doing so for a, a couple of years now. And they're going to uh, provide us with some insights from a report that uh, they have just presented to the uh, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Um, and I'd like to introduce to you um, Aaron Atteridge and Claudia Strambo, both from SEI, um, and uh, their work on just transitions and how that can be a guide for the COVID-19 recovery. Over to you, Aaron and Claudia. Thank you, Rob, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my colleague Aaron and I will now share with you a few insights from the study we did for the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, the EBRD, to support its design, its just transition work. Um, here, just transition, uh, we're uh, talking about the broad idea that the costs of uh, decarbonization will not be evenly distributed within and across economies, and therefore workers, communities, uh, regions that are uh, dependent on uh, carbon in, in intensive industries need specific support to make that shift, as, as we've heard already uh, uh, many examples earlier on. So it's about making the process and the outcome as fair as possible. So in this study, um, we um, we look at how a just transition um, can be designed, taking into account the experience of a past mining and industrial decline. And we think that many of these findings are relevant for guiding the implementation of the EU Green Deal, of course, because just transition is one of its core um, uh, principles, but also especially relevant in the post-COVID-19 context because they can also offer a direction for the large fiscal stimulus packages that are being rolled out in uh, response to the economic crisis. So in the next slide, I will just go briefly through some uh, background about the, the study. Uh, so we basically did four things. We reviewed the academic and grey literature about just transition to see how it's been defined and operationalized in practice. And from that, we distilled some uh, a set of key principles uh, to plan and implement just transitions. And my colleague Aaron will get back to that in a few minutes. We also reviewed more than 200 cases of mining and industrial transition that have been documented in the literature all around the world and different sectors. Um, and we looked at the impacts and responses to industrial decline and we identified where possible what has worked and what has not. 
Um, so we built on previous work we've done on mining transition, the, the studies you have in green on the top of the slide. Then we complemented that review with four in-depth case studies. And on this basis, we reflected on how institutions like the EBRD can play a role in supporting just transition. Now, the study covers many uh, issues from uh, support to affected workers, communities, the issue of environmental rehabilitation that uh, has been mentioned uh, uh, already, and also questions linked to the process of planning uh, transition itself. But for today, we picked some key insights that uh, are especially interesting in the context of this webinar and that we hope can generate some interesting discussion. So in the next slide, I'll give you a bit of a flavor of some of the findings we got from um, from uh, history, from, from historical cases of transition about the governance of just transitions. So the first point is that the role of the state is uh, very tricky to navigate at the national level. The state has a very important role to play in terms of financing programs uh, and infrastructure development, strategic investments, steering the private sector uh, and, and also a policy setting and convening role. But historically, we see that often the national government has not shown any inclination to be transparent about mine or industry uh, closure or to engage with transition planning. And moreover, when the central uh, government does engage, it has not necessarily been in a productive way. So just transition really need proactive, specific and holistic approaches. But typically, the response of the national government has been to apply a blanket approach that does not address local needs and, and the challenges that arise with uh, industrial decline. Also, the national government's objective might not automatically be aligned with local or, and, and regional economic priorities and, and strategies. There is a very interesting example uh, in the EBRD and uh, E3G report about coal regions where they find um, that in nearly all the, 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 the cases they look at, local actors are wanting to uh, transition away from coal, but it's the national government that remits committed to coal as a uh, uh, energy resource uh, and uh, an energy source and that has close links to uh, the industry. Um, so in practice, local governments uh, have often uh, been left carrying many of the burdens of industrial decline and therefore they may need assistance with additional resources, technical support, scenario planning and debt relief. And of course, these are things that are very much relevant in the context of uh, the COVID-19 recovery too. Now, this focus on subnational uh, government uh, capacity is very important because what history shows also is that locally driven approaches to regional economic development planning um, appear to be more effective than top down one and to correspond better to workers and citizens needs and visions. So really here we see that um, there's been a lot of response from uh, from governments uh, around the world and, and, and in Europe to the crisis, but there, there's been an issue of anticipation, right? We, we were not ready and that's a pattern that we can see also uh, in the planning of, of uh, industrial and, and, and mining transition. So striking the right balance in the involvement of different state actors, it's really a delicate, um, a delicate task. Now, the last point I want to make about the governance of just transition is that um, we also see that many communities and regions that face future transitions, um, they do it from a position of vulnerability um, inherited by uh, sometimes several rounds of economic crisis or changes in economic policy, also environmental damage from uh, heavy industry and mining operation. And then if you look at cases such as Rochester in New York, uh, where the Kodak plant closed at the end of uh, the, the, the past century. It's one of the cases we looked at in, in the report. Then you might at first sight think, oh, that, that successful economic growth is back. Uh, demographic uh, growth is back. Um, jobs have been created. But if you zoom in and you look at the most vulnerable people and the lower skilled workers, the picture is very different. And they have not had access to the opportunities that's been created in the process and there are significant inequalities uh, remaining or maybe even have worsened. So here really this highlights the need to have indicators that uh, really long to measure the impact of just transition responses beyond things like 
economic diversification, uh, number of jobs created and uh, economic growth. And I leave the floor to my colleague now. Thanks, Claudia, and thanks to everyone for the invitation to join with this. Um, in the interest of just being very quick, uh, I'll just take a few minutes. I think I really just wanted to add to today's discussion uh, three key points that comes out of um, some of this work. The first one is that, as Claudia mentioned, what, what we did was, in addition to reviewing a lot of historical cases of industrial mining transition, we also looked across the just transition, the conceptual literature, because the term is used a lot nowadays, but it's not always defined when it's used, um, and it tends to be used by stakeholders to sort of match their own uh, agendas and their own set of interests. So you have quite a lot of different angles on, on a just transition. And what we tried to do is integrate them together into, uh, as best we could, a, a complementary or a coherent set of principles that could be applied as a framework for sort of decision making. Um, and the important thing here is, I, I don't have time to go through them all, um, but you can look at them. Um, the important thing really is that there's no hierarchy here, that they all need to be promoted and pursued in parallel. So for instance, the decarbonisation agenda, which is necessarily part of the just transition, um, cannot be delayed because of impact on workers. Um, that would be fundamentally unjust from a global equity perspective. So you have to do deep decarbonisation and strong support for workers at the same time. Um, and that's critical to this set of principles, um, I think. And as Claudia mentioned, the, the Green Deal and is fundamentally a transition agenda, is fundamentally a low carbon transition agenda. So a lot of these, or all of these principles translate directly into implementation of the Green Deal, if it is also has as an objective uh, that that transition for European countries should be just. So I think the other two points I wanted to make, beginning with the next slide, uh, relate more to uh, what changes now in this picture, or what changes in, in the way we think about this as a result of the COVID-19 situation. Uh, and Maria touched on this a little bit before. Um, but I think fundamentally what's changed is that we begin the promotion of a Green Deal and the, the aspiration for a just transition from an even more difficult situation uh, for a lot of people and a lot of economies. In terms of um, job losses, the, the, current, uh, finance, the current economic and social restrictions um, will have created much more unemployment than uh, decarbonisation in Europe will in the coming years. Um, in terms of the fiscal impacts on, on governments and increasing debt loss and revenue, the current COVID crisis will be several orders of magnitude more significant than decarbonisation will. Not necessarily at a very local scale, but across Europe. Uh, then you've got the question of inequality, and I mean, there's a lot of work looking at how COVID-19 has unevenly affected again, poorest communities, poorest regions, um, and there's concerns uh, about whether it is also now embedding a greater equality within Europe between countries, and I think that's been mentioned already. Uh, and the other thing to, to talk about this change context I think is interesting is the IEA talking about how it's really undermining the fossil fuel industry. And the IEA is not known for being a, a very, um, they're quite a conservative organisation, I think, when they talk about future energy pathways. And, they're talking about that the current situation is really changing the, the foundations of the fossil fuel sector. So on one hand, you, you might think that makes the, the, the green transition a bit easier uh, because these industries are coming from a weaker position to begin with. But the flip side is that the communities that depend on those industries now are already feeling the pain and they're starting the transition from a, a, a place of more hardship. So fundamentally, I think this makes uh, the Green Deal necessary, uh, but even harder to implement. Um, and I think that's really important to think about. And the last point I wanted to make was really about the role of finance and public finance. If, uh, if you move to the next slide, please. Um, this is the setup of the just transition, transition mechanism within the, the current Green Deal. Um, and you see um, up to 100 billion in financing, um, including within the just transition fund. Two things that I wanted, two points I wanted to make about this. One is that it's predominantly debt finance, um, yeah, and that's uh, that means that the costs of, of low of carbon transition, the, the redistributional costs, are still borne by countries that have to transition hardest. Uh, what this 
proposal does is makes that, make that finance available now to draw on future revenues, but those costs are still borne by those countries. Um, and one would question at the end of this kind of COVID-19 crisis with debt levels spiraling, how much appetite there is to take on more debt. Um, so I think that's a, a, a question worth asking. And the second point um, which shows on the next slide is really about the scale of responses to COVID-19 in relation to the scale of uh, financial resources talked about the just transition. Um, and this slide, I just put it together from the IMF's estimates of current, this currently agreed or, or under negotiation measures within just the EU's five G20 member countries. So not even across the entire European Union. And you see the scale of uh, public financial measures that are being made available within countries and, and a small amount from the EU itself. Um, and in comparison with on the far right, this just transition mechanism of $100 billion. But what that means for me is, um, I think the biggest question here is that the scale of these resources can either fundamentally undermine everything that the Green, the Green Deal and the Just Transition Mechanism is trying to do, or it can be used, if we could, if it can be influenced, it can be used in a really positive way to help progress that same agenda. And I think that this is where we need to focus attention in the short term. Um, I just added also the scale of bailouts for European airlines here as an example, because I think it's, um, it's also on a par, it's on a par with the scale of the just transition mechanism, around 30 billion euros to date in, within Europe. Um, and why it's interesting? Well, firstly, um, this is, uh, most of the bailouts have been targeting the corporate uh, element of that sector rather than workers, um, but also because this is a fossil fuel intensive sector. So uh, this, this bailout money is not contingent on any sort of climate reforms. And I think these are really interesting things that we need to talk about as a, community interested in the Green Deal. Uh, now when there's this much money being mobilised, how do we make it operate um, in the direction of the Green Deal and not undermine what the Green Deal is trying to do? So on the last slide, I just left you a couple of the references to the study Fabio was talking about and, and this comes from, if you're interested. Um, and I think the important thing, it, the political economy of this makes it necessary that countries that are resistant to the idea now of Green Deal, that has been resistance to, as was mentioned, you know, as a, as a result of COVID-19, should we delay the Green Deal? If this is going to work, these, these countries need to understand and really believe that the transition agenda has just uh, equity and justice at its core. I think that's fundamentally a challenge for us now. So I'll leave it there, Rob, in the interest of time. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, Greg, I think you've been collecting a few more questions um, from our participants. Go ahead. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you so much, Claudia and, and Aaron. Um, there was uh, some question in, in some discussion before in food, and now after we've heard uh, the, the, uh, the work that uh, our colleagues at SI have done, uh, there was a question by Lucia who asked about food and why food that requires quite a lot of production and distribution, transformation, and, and processing, of course, but it also needs to be cheap. Um, but that, of course, makes it you know a, a very unjust sector of sorts. So, what determines uh, what, what should guide us in shortening supply chain, in, in transitioning our economies towards more sustainable uh, practices, but at the same time keeping things affordable, such as food? That would be one question. I give you I give you three uh, to shorten this a little bit. Um, the other one was by Ilya Neudecker, and she asked particularly if structural funds could be used to help restructure economies, uh, and if uh, the wealthier EU countries in the North and Western Europe could support their southern and eastern neighbours in the kind of the, the role of the ex circular economy and how would that look like? And ultimately, uh, a third question that we touched on, I think, throughout this webinar is what is the impact of COVID-19 of the economic recovery on international collaboration uh, and in particular uh, on EU-China uh, and EU-US relations, given that a lot of the things that we're touching upon here are ultimately uh, a part of globalization and increased internationalization and interdependence. So I would suggest we start off with the easy question, quote unquote, on, on what is just transition and in making things, um, making particularly food more affordable, but also, um, but also just. 
Um, any any takers for that question? That was the easy one. OK, that was the easy one. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, I mean, this is nobody said that just transition was easy. In fact, it makes life harder. It just makes the outcomes better. I think that's the whole idea. Um, you can look at any sector and see uh, opportunities for greening, if you like, um, balanced against opportunities for dealing with uh, other vulnerable uh, populations. So if you're talking about cheap food, who needs cheap food is people that don't have much money. Um, it's the poor. So. There's no reason why just transition um, lens doesn't allow you to uh, green uh, the agricultural sector, for instance, at the same time as providing other social safety nets that make things like food or energy uh, affordable for those who really struggle with that as a financial burden. So I think that's really important. And something that I, I, I'm not an expert on the Green Deal, but um, perhaps one of the other speakers could comment on that, but one thing I sense when I read it, and especially the just transition mechanism, is it frames this debate as being a lot about energy and environment, um, the energy environment sector. So even the investments that are supported by the just transition mechanism are a lot about the um, energy and environment sectors. But what's needed to support proper holistic societal just transition is much broader than that. So you can have investments, you need investments in social safety nets, for instance, at the same time as you need investments in decarbonisation and greening the food sector and so on. So I think that they're not contradictory, they just need to be thought about more holistically. Okay. You get uh, the ones, Claudia. Yeah, I was just going to add that like for other aspects of the, the transition agenda, it's both about behavior change and systemic change, like like also Celine mentioned the importance of systemic change. So food is the same. It's about like, do we really need an avocado and a steak every day? But it's a lot about what are the structure that um, uh, make um, uh, possible that we get food for such a, uh, a low price um, in Europe and that there is such amount of waste also. I mean, for instance. <laughs> Perhaps Celine yeah. would like to come in on the on the international aspects um, of the recovery and, and perhaps even the geopolitical um, uh, relations, uh, whether or not the, whether whether they are going to help or hinder uh, the, the the recovery, a green recovery. Uh, yes, thanks. I think the first thing to say is is this whole crisis is is happening in a context where in Europe there was uh, thinking among the, the, the foreign security experts of this new concept of strategic sovereignty. Yes, Europe has values, but Europe needs to uh, play a bigger role in uh, the international uh, arena to make sure its, uh, its values are actually being taken up. Uh, yes, it needs to be uh, in, in in uh, supporting, continuing to support multilateralism, but it also needs to be able to defend itself when other players are not playing a fair game. So now that we have this very acrimonious debate uh, around who is to blame for the COVID crisis, but we also start seeing countries uh, thinking of trade restrictions. Um, you know, I think we, we're going to see some really difficulties around uh, the multilateral uh, uh, scene uh, continuing. And the question is, what can Europe do to make sure that we come to a sensible discussion around coordinating recovery, making sure that recovery is not a, a free for all uh, protectionist bonanza that's not going to help uh, anyone, uh, but also making sure that the, the Paris uh, uh, commitments will be uh, respected as part of the recovery. And that's why it would be fantastic if at the forthcoming EU-China summit, there could be an understanding between China and Europe about a, a green recovery uh, a pathways and also other things that the EU and China could do, such as cooperating on circular economy standards to make sure that we see an acceleration and take up of uh, more sustainable practices as part of what is now being called green and resilient supply chain, so that if there is any sort of deglobalization, it is not uh, at the expense of the poorest countries of the world, but it is also in favor of greater sustainability. 
And there was a last question there on the use of structural funds to help restructure economies in Europe South and East and particularly on the circular economy. Any taker for that question? Well, actually, it's, yeah, I, I can say something. It's quite striking that if you look at what is being looked, uh, what is being, for instance, explored at the moment uh, in terms of big projects as part of the green recovery, uh, there's, there's, it's more on the climate side, really, than on the circular economy side. So I think there's a bit of struggle to figure out what would be large scale projects. Uh, that both deliver in terms of carbon uh, uh, neutral uh, carbon neutrality and uh, circular economy. And I think what would be really fantastic is if as part of the territorial just transition plans, which is this new mechanism being looked at, one could integrate the circular economy element because it's really important if you really want to build a circular economy to look at the territoriality. Uh, and where do you need to have very short uh, circles, very local ones? Someone talked about shorter supply chains. And, and what is the relationship between a, a territory and the rest of the economy uh, to make sure that we reduce uh, the, the waste of, of materials and can really create uh, circularity? And I, I think we need a green Marshall Plan for the South and the Central and Eastern Europe, which are countries that are very vulnerable to pollution, to climate change, but also the least able to finance. We looked at the graph and let's look at how much Germany is already putting money on the table. And if we don't uh, take care of that, we will see even less of a chance for those parts of Europe to compete uh, with the giants uh, of Europe and their industry, which will have been pumped up by trillions of state aid. Celine, thank you very much. Thanks, Greg, also for um, keeping track of um, a really uh, great set of questions that have been coming in. I'm, I'm, I'd like to say um, thank you to everybody for engaging in, in the Q&A. Um, I'm sorry that we haven't got to all of the questions. I think we've tried to pick up some common threads that came up uh, in that online discussion. Um, so I'd like really to thank you, everybody who's participated, everyone who's sent in questions for being so engaged in, in this conversation. And, and I think that we've heard uh, some very interesting different perspectives uh, perspectives from from political decision makers, uh, from think tanks, and from researchers on on why uh, it's so crucial to make sure that we're not leaving anybody behind. That we do address fundamental vulnerabilities that are perhaps even being more revealed during this crisis as we try and put together a set of uh, a green recovery, sustainable, resilient and just recovery measures. And that was a sort of three things in particular that I, 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 I was struck by. One, one is this issue of making sure that we get the timing right, the sequencing right, that we aren't uh, delaying, but that we also are paying attention towards uh, people who are trying to readjust trying to get back into work and making sure that there's legitimacy in the decisions. The second is um, around the, the scale of the financing that's being uh, put on the table and the need to make sure that it's enough, that uh, it is addressing both the recovery, the transition and uh, the just transition, um, but also that there is a real potential or discrepancy between or expectations between what can be achieved with public money, with debt financing and what's available in, in, in the private finance sector as well. And then lastly, I think that Celine began to talk a lot more around the, the circular economy as something that we need to be moving towards and that there are policies there that could really be made to, uh, to, to brought into play to support uh, a, a Green Deal for all and a just transition. So I'd like to thank everybody uh, in the panel for their contributions, their presentations, and thank you in, in the audience uh, for listening and for asking such great questions. Um, and I encourage you to uh, check out the uh, website of IEP where you'll find their latest report and also SEI's website where you'll find the work of uh, Aaron and Claudia on Just Transitions. With that, thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, bye.